Breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving Game Masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Giant monsters, man. Giant monsters and giant robots. They are. This is probably... the movie I wanted Transformers to be. I agree with you. And uh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's Rock'em Sock'em Robot with alien monsters. And what movie is that? Voltron. <laughs> Yes, Voltron. <laughs> Voltron on Netflix, by the way, is amazing. Yes, oh, it no. is. It is great. It's Pacific no, Rim. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're doing yeah. Pacific Rim, and uh, as every week, I'm Matthew, and I'm Dusty, and I'm Nathaniel, and you are listening to Have Movies Will Game and spoilers. Ah, uh, you got me. Spoilers. <laughs> we frequently forget to say that until but, I think the last few episodes has been like ten or fifteen minutes into yeah. it. When we finally say, oh, yeah, by the way, spoilers. Well, you know what? We're going to lead with that shit. Yeah. Spoilers, <laughs> and you need to go watch the movie because it's awesome. It Pacific Rim is like the the 12 year old that stuck it in my head. It tickles like, every everything that Matthew wants in a movie. Yeah. It needed robots a little more TNA. Mm-hmm. It needed Giant a scary more monsters TNA, versus big badass robots. Perfect. I think it was perfect without the TNA. I, I am glad that there was no TNA in this movie. I'm a simple man of simple pleasures. And, <laughs> you know. There wasn't even kissing. There was no romance in this movie. There, there was, was implied, implied romance. romance. No, I disagree. They had a nice, they had, they were bonded. Yeah, like, they, there was they, chemistry, yeah. They there was implied romance. For a bit. If you're in each other's head and you're fucking, is that masturbation? But they weren't fucking. And it or, is that, or is that's that just, just, that's just a fantasy? That's or just is, a or is that some sort of a like vivid fantasy, like ethereal soul bonding shit? What what's going on there? Because if you're in the other person's head and the other person's in your head, and you're diddling each other's fun bits, well, have you seen? That's Strange the thing Days? that stuck. That I have does, because that happened in Strange. Yeah, Days. but I want to do it with. I, I want to do that without say the the whole like bathroom scene in Strange Days. I, 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 mean, I do too. More, yeah. more consensual than Strange Days. I'll oh drink to that. God. Definitely. But I'm really glad that this movie did not have any romance. It didn't need it. I so are you familiar with the Bechdel test? No. Mm-hmm. The Bechdel test being I thought it was Bechel. I, I call it the Bechdel test. It's We're gonna go with E-C-H-T. him and not you on this. I hear it as Bechel <laughs> test from everyone that brings it up. Well, everybody who brings it up forgets that there's a D in the word. Now the Bechdel test is this test about whether or not a movie meets certain feminist requirements of do the female characters talk to each other and do they talk to each other about something other than the men? There, there's more to it than that, but it's basically a test of whether or not the women in the movie are actually interesting characters or if they're just there to empower the men. And then this movie came out and it didn't quite meet the Bechdel test because there were no other women. And yet it created a new spinoff, the Mako Mori test, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, so, you take it what you will. Some people might not agree that that's even a thing, but her character was driven. Mm hmm did not really have any kind of leading, you know, inspiration to impress a man other than whooping his ass, whooping his ass. She, she was definitely her own character and there was her own motivations. There was was motivation to to make sure that, that her, uh, her, the, her father figure, father figure. Thank you. Was impressed with what she was doing. Yeah. But that's, that's standard. That's not a, that's not a, a, it was less a a matter of impressing him and more a matter of being, she wanted to do what she was promised to do, Mm. not because she wanted to impress him, but because he fucking told her, Hey, I'm going to let you do this thing. She, she is, she's a good character. Oh yeah. She is a great character. She is one of only what two women, I think in the whole thing, the other one being the Russian who we know nothing about. Uh, It's an NPC. Yeah. That's a shame. Now I feel bad about asking for TNA, but I'm going to stand by it because I like TNA. The Russians, the Russians, 
That they were so cool. They were so Russian. Very, want, they were wanted, stereotypical Russian. I wanted to see more of their suit because it was a completely different design. Like this heavy, like bell of a head. And I just I wanted I think for what they were putatively supposed to have accomplished, they kind of went down like bitches. Well, no, them and the Chinese too. Yeah. The the, <laughs> the three arms the squad. Yeah. yeah. The the Typhoon and Cherno. They both went down like, oh, we get them built up. Oh, these are these other, and these it's one on one too. And then suddenly, it's not oh, like they were well, nailed by a wave of them. I they thought it was odd one. because the Russian, when they made a very distinct point to say that they had held the line for six years and never yeah. let any of the of the beasts get through for six fucking years, and then one of them in Shinhai water, well, the ocean, all of a sudden <laughs> takes them down. And that's yeah. that's one of my biggest problems with the movie is that is the fucking ocean. And I'll get to that later. So let's bring this back. Mm -hmm. Pacific Rim. Dusty, lead us in. We've already been led in, but lead us in again. Oh, no. I, 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 I want to say something real sure, fast. Sure, please. Okay. The IBM XT green monochrome beginning mm -hmm. followed by, like, hyper futuristic stuff. Fucking loved it. Oh, so did I. Like, I, I had that monitor. Well, I think we all did. Took me a second to realize what you were talking about. Yeah. Oh. So, like, the, okay. very, the very intro where they're explaining the Jaeger and the... Uh, Cajun, Cajun, the Kaiju, 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 Kaiju. Okay. Kaiju. But uh, that that it was a complete departure from the the feel of the rest of the movie. But it set a tonality that my generation is very familiar with. We see that color typing in on the screen. Mm -hmm. We it, it triggers something in our hind brain, and we know what's coming. We 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 get a feeling for the movie already. Also have uh, memories of like the Oregon Trail because that was on the load up screen. Oh, that I was going to go with like Space Camp, but yeah. Space Camp, okay. yeah. Yeah, Oregon Trail. Oregon oh, Trail. God. 2001, so stuff like that. <laughs> Just that particular kind of monochromatic that entry. That bulky yeah. lettering that would go across the screen with the flashing. Yes, yeah. Alien. Yeah. Yeah. So Pacific Rim, the movie we're talking about, it is pretty much the 12 year old that's stuck inside my head. This is like. His dream movie. It's giant scary monsters versus big badass robots. Yes. And it had a $200 million budget at the time. All CGI. Because yeah, all much. of well, it was CGI. That was, so that no, was, no, no, that no. Was really not all of it. CGI, there was a lot that was, that was actual yeah. practical. The, um, the cockpit was practical. They made a, a one cockpit for all of the. Of yeah, the, so two sets. <laughs> uh, plus, there was a lot of uh, miniature buildings that they made with 3D printers. And they had a very large, uh, like a metal hand come through, and they went back with the digital guide you. Okay, you say two sets, but they show the insides of Gypsy Danger, Cherno, whatever, Typhoon, whatever, and Douchebag, McGee's. Painting is an amazing thing, it, isn't it? Because they, they all have so different color schemes. Set. It was they, one set. They did a really good job yes. of dressing them differently for each of them. Yes, the yeah, every cockpit yeah. was, it was, every cockpit because, that you see is yeah. one cockpit and they redressed it for each one. They did a really good job. Every, yeah. every background, with the exception of a couple city takes before, was CG. And honestly, I, I could see it. Um, I could see the CG. The, it wasn't oh. as seamless as they they as it. Well, felt the movie came the out theater. in 2013, so yeah. some of the graphics are better now. We've was, gotten used to what, it. What version did you watch? Because I watched the super. I have the one year version. Plex. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't pause on any of these things. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't either. But I mean, I I, I, could I thought it looked pretty it. good. That said, I, I also yeah. thought the Fifth Element looks really good, and you guys <laughs> proved me wrong on that. <laughs> it 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 was good and it does hold up, but there was a couple things where it felt like video game cutscene, where yes, it just a lot of it did. where it just changed. A and lot of the problem with things CG got flat and, is lighting. Mm -hmm. One of the that's biggest, the main trouble with that CG. Is, it's making it look well lit, but when the whole thing is CG, you can get away with a lot more. All of the ocean scenes with the robots and all of that, because they were all CG. And thankfully, it always happened at night. Yes. It always happened always at night. Always happens at night. Except there were a few flashbacks and some shots in the day, such as the wall and Mako Mori's memory. Of that, that was fight. a great memory. But but all of those were shot in hazy scenes. Yes. That that scene with, with the the younger version of, of her 
that was, was great so fucking actress cute. Yeah. Too. now the, oh, the whole thing yes. that was a practical none of that was cg they put a, uh was on a hydraulic sound set so that every time the 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 kaiju went by everything vibrated yeah. on on hydraulic so it actually so the, the tears are look, real are so yeah the frightened thing. look from the girl are, are like she's actually scared because yes they sacrifice didn't for her. your art child they didn't tell this her won't affect you in later life they were going all. to <laughs> They didn't tell her when they were going to like move everything. This is why you shoot overseas whenever possible, because they don't have our laws and you're allowed to terrify children. <laughs> that little girl was adorable. Yes. She was amazing. And, and the, she acted so well. The expression on yeah. her face, it, it, she was really good. It was clear that, that she was in the moment. And I, I applaud you, little yeah. girl. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the opening montage. That told us everything we needed to know, and it was really well done. Yes. It, I mean, I, I'm, you, you I'm letting you the, go the, with that. The, I agree with you on that because uh, go. The, it's the history <laughs> montage uh, displaying the probable reactions of humanity mm -hmm. and like the dirty end of it, the merchandising, you know, um, yes. the talk shows, the stuffed animals, everything the that toys. We, it's going to happen when something like this. I, I thought that was actually, happen. and I didn't appreciate it the first time around when I saw this. But as I, you know, I'm sitting down and I'm picking it apart for the podcast. I'm like. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly insightful. Did you notice some of the headlines that were flowing? I did. By? Yeah. My favorite yes. one: Kaiju excrement contaminates yeah. city. Yeah, loved it. Yeah, uh, and then, but at the end of it, okay, it was ruined by the narrator. It was ruined by the narrator. Especially was he, the that the hero? Yes, the, he. You know what? Hero, quote he unquote. He himself yeah. was okay. He wasn't bad. However, the he last was line overshadowed. The last line of his narrative. Then it all changed. No, it didn't all change. It just changed for you. Yeah. Your brother died. Oh, oh fucking who? Your brother died. <laughs> Guess what? Humanity's about to be murdered by these monsters. Then it all changed. Nothing changed. Only you did. And that was my one complaint with that narrative. I my complaint with the narrative is that that whole that it was it was good for what it was, but the whole narrative was a standard. The world is is coming to an end. Trope. I mean, I'm tired every, of action heroes talking flat. Yeah, there's that too. Well, but, but, but it was fucker. it That's was Charlie Hunnam. It was it's, it's used John over Rick, and over and everyone. over and over again. And then even the last line, it all changed. No, in, in a world of John Wicks and John Wick spin-offs, <laughs> fucking uh be die hard, okay? Just well, be no, die hard. No, John Wick The Rock is doing a die hard type. What movie. I love is that Good. John what I love is that John Wick was so minimal with what he said. I'm, I'm just I'm getting tired of it. I'm I'm really getting bored with the <laughs> disinterested flat mail delivery and an action lead. It's fucking dull. It's dull as it's dull as a bag of flaccid dicks. The opposite. So bag of flaccid dicks. I just wanted to yell that. <laughs> <laughs> the other side to that coin is the overly hammed up Nathan Fillion who only works if it's Nathan Fillion but then everybody else tries yeah, to do it so okay. have you're a PlayStation person Matthew actually I'm an Xbox but I do have a PlayStation oh, I thought Go. you were sorry have you played any of the Uncharted series oh god yes exactly that's what you get if you don't do the stoic male hero you'll get the wise cracking guy who's always got something waiting to say about everything you're like shut the fuck up you're not Han Solo yeah stop trying to be him Every Speaking actor, of which, are we doing solo? Yes, we are. <laughs> Every actor needs to find their own stride. Yeah. Unfortunately, Be Charlie, yourself. Unfortunately, Charlie Hunnam's stride is Jax Teller from Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. That's mm. all he can do. That's what he did in King Arthur. That's what he did in this movie. This movie was Jax Teller punching aliens. Why is the Golden Gate Bridge such a target for everyone? Like I in don't every know. in every apocalypse movie, it's one of the first things to go. Well, it's an American icon. Much yeah. like well, so was the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. So the Statue of Liberty. But the Statue of Liberty, like Mount Rushmore, at Washington. Least, at least the Transformers know. did Hoover Dam. Yes. One thing I will say is that the Golden Gate Bridge made sense because it was only Pacific Rim yeah. cities. Pacific Rim yeah. being the name of the movie. Oregon, by the way, seems to have got off scot free, which is one of the reasons I moved here. Just because you know, giant gives, robot. Well, yeah. yeah, nobody cares about the Oregon. Coast. Well, I mean, you got <laughs> military north, you got military south. Oregon, we're like, yeah. we'll attack the hippies after we take care of them. <laughs> you know? oh God. So anyway, Pacific Rim. Yes, directed by Guillermo del Toro, uh, who's also known for The Shape of Water, the Hobbit series. The Hellboy series, ah. Hans Labyrinth, and Mimic, among others. I really like Del Toro's work. You totally left out Hellboy. No, I said he Hellboy did. series. He said it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I'm going to cut that part then. No, keep it in. That's great. Yeah, you're allowed to make mistakes too, yeah. buddy. No, I, I totally misheard you. I heard <laughs> the Hobbit series, and I was like, is he known for the Hobbit series or just one I movie? know you just got started, but I have to say something. Yes, sir. Do you know that in every space armor montage scene where, be it Master Chief getting his armor mm-hmm. on, whoever it is, it's always slow. It's always cool. There are 360 pan shots, so you can see the armor. It's the Michael on. Bay of armor stuff. But you never ever see the most vital connection in that armor the diaper the diaper or the catheter coming on and i th- i would have i would have loved it so I much laugh so hard if, i'll cough if there was like uh the tube approaching the groin and then you pan up to the face and you see a ooh. <laughs> no. this and this would have been the movie where you would have expected it because in many ways it was very self-aware this yeah. is it made fun of itself it a couple did. times which this was is, nice this is a really 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 stupid movie but it knows but it's it. a fun stupid yeah. movie it knows it and it owns it and it's awesome Did you and it never it? tried to be anything else and when, that's so important when you watch the armor when they were putting when they were putting them into their suits did you happen to notice that the, the, the spinal piece that they were they would hold on to and it was like clanking yeah. on its own and then it would go in i thought that was kind of cool I yeah mean, it, it just like, like this aware piece like wants to get into the suit i i think it's a shock absorber and, and oh. stringer bell had one when he put on the suit at the end too yeah mm-hmm. yeah it was uh, the sc- anyway. You have to pee in a suit. <laughs> it's basically my point, and no one ever covers it. And it's very important. It's an ankle bag. That's what they have. You have to attach you know, what's it. What's funny is that you say this, and you have to pee in a suit, and you you want people to cover it. But Chuck Windig wrote the Star Wars novels that bridge the gap between Return of the Jedi and whatever bullshit Episode Seven was. And in it, he talks about space diapers. And it's one of the biggest complaints against the entire Star Wars series is those <laughs> stupid fucking space diapers that Chuck Wendig put in. Now, I myself oh my haven't read it. I don't care. But, you know what? Occasionally, I do wonder how they pee in space. You do not want to clean out the fecal matter repository. So make sure before you get into your Jaeger, take a dump. At least in Dune. <laughs> he comes right out and yeah, says it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, it's, it is it's important. Uh, <laughs> just... <laughs> Like uh, one of my favorite sci-fi authors, uh, John Ringo, covers it in extreme depth. <laughs> Some of the funniest stuff. And I just, like? I'd love to see a movie cover it. What's Give that? Give us an I example, like. please. Give us an example. Uh, it's it's in the book, uh, Tro- it's in the Troy Rising series, which is fantastic. And it's about this uh, this noob recruit coming in to join you know the space Same. force new recruit or noob recruit He's noob noob fantastic yeah. Yeah. Love it. and it was this whole thing about how the instructor was embarrassed to tell her about it because he was a guy and she was a girl one of the few girls in the in the space corps mm. and um I, I don't have the joke on hand but i mean it's, it's fucking good and yeah this part you can cut i think that if the aliens were really this likely to attack us We'd also be more likely to come up with methods that didn't involve giant fucking robots. We oh, would static have, defenses, imagine a line. Yeah. It would be remote controlled, if not drones. We'd come up mm-hmm. with something significantly less expensive than a robot the size of a city. I, I was going to say just, I mean. And we wouldn't. I actually have this, this covered piloted. in the game, <laughs> I, in, in my game notes for this. All right. Um, but how I see it is like a, a vast network of fort of fortress around the gate. You can walk right up to the gate. Did you know that? It's only like thirty feet high in the ocean there. I noticed that. So it wouldn't be that hard to sink a concrete piling around it and put a big ass fucking gun on top. Wait, 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 wait. Thirty feet high? What? Yeah, it was only shin height right up until they dove. Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> that was way more than thirty feet. Now, to the shin? No, like the head was like 40 50 feet tall Did all right so 50 of that? 50 feet we can right, still sink so up high so the wall that was that probably deep. like that 200 was just feet. the head so i'm thinking okay again I, I do think that they're walking through the ocean thing was a little silly yeah because they were a mile out at least a mile out from the coast and that yeah. water is going to be a lot deeper than a mile that out said, when they were finally when they dropped down to the to the gate mm-hmm. they were deep underwater to the point that when they blew up the nuke near the end and all the water went rushing away mm-hmm. i love that touch that was i thought the bubble the water, yeah yeah it, it, co- it expanded and contracted at, yeah and they were deep underwater at that mm-hmm. point it wasn't no, just that was good feet high there was a lot of like really beautiful cd cg touches in this I like agree. I, I like when 
I liked the dust flows and I liked how the, whenever there was an explosion or a crash through a building, it was dirty smoke. Like it looked like when a building gets hit by a car, <laughs> all this nasty ass dust and shit shakes through and it's thick and it's black and it's disgusting. And that was, that was the cloud effects that they used. And I thought that was a very nice touch that brought me into it. One thing I thought though, this was to Charlie Hunnam at the very beginning when he was in the, the critical pivotal scene at the very beginning with his brother. That was the year 2020. No, it was 2013. That's no, it was 2020. 2020. No, 2020. The start of the movie is 2013. The start of the movie is 2020. The movie was mm. released in 2013. But no, he, I, he specifically said 2020. Okay. Well, it said it on the screen. Yeah. Ah, and then my it mistake. Said okay. Five years later or something like that. Okay, right? my mistake. 2020, right? And then five years had passed. And Hong Kong is still a bustling city. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me because five years had passed and we're talking about like one kaiju attack a month or more. All of the nations would have evacuated their coastal cities by that point. Hong, Hong Kong, Kong has nowhere else to go. It's an independent nation when it was given back by the British. Hong it Kong, can't be well, reabsorbed well, into China. Well, 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 well. We're talking about modern politics. We're not talking about politics where giant Future. monsters are attacking <laughs> the fucking planet. <laughs> Hong Kong, they did, San Francisco. They did say they put aside all their differences. So Yeah, all of those nations would have pulled their city. They would have evacuated the coastal towns. There's no reason for Hong Kong to have been a bustling, well-built metropolis that had already been stated had been attacked. You know, times. in every in every future that I see, the waterways are still important as a cheap way to move and import goods. Until you have transporter technology, the interior of a country isn't going to be as important as the exterior because it's cheaper to move shit that way. I know, but it's no longer cheaper when all of your cities and buildings and everything is being destroyed in a blink on a of an monthly eye. basis, I, you know they don't have our building monster. codes. They can just throw them up a lot easier. It's, it's okay. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't think Hong Kong too. would have 3D been... printers. I mean, come on, I they just, got it. I have a hard time believing Hong Kong would have been as developed as it was showing. It showed no signs whatsoever of former attacks, and they had already stated that attacks were happening. Like, oh yeah, weekly. If like not, Seattle was yeah. hit. No, because there were some cutscenes of like down. Um, kaiju that were in the city and they just put built the city they kept building the city around all of those remains there's just enough it shows the human spirit there Nathaniel. are inconsistencies <laughs> with it oh there are a lot of inconsistencies with this movie but we we know this and i want to talk about BS the drift real fast the drift it was fucking cool wasn't it here's the thing it's a blatant ripoff of robotech's thinking cap that's okay that's that's, fine. that's how you movie control is not it original and anyway. I just wanted to say that the Robotex thinking cap looks a lot cooler. It really does. It's a pretty badass way to control a mecha, and you don't need a partner. So protoculture wins. You know what else you don't Nuclear need? Nuclear fission does not. What else you don't need with the thinking cap? What? Brom! <laughs> <laughs> Brom! That's, that's true. You just fucking think. Thanks, Inception. I was going to say the same thing. You. I really like that Hans noise. Zimmer. Yes. Oh, God, I hate Zimmer. it. It's I my... hate it. I'm so tired of it. Yeah? It's just what Hollywood uses when they want to create a, priv- uh, create a pivotal moment. The br- well, it wasn't like, used the until... Noise coming from? It wasn't I used like it until Inception. It wasn't used, yeah. Suddenly Inception, after Inception, everybody's like... Commercials, TV yeah. shows, music. It exploded everywhere just for that reason, because it's new. It got old. <laughs> yeah, it, it, no, I, I, very I, fast. I'm not disagreeing with your point. I'm just saying it's so rare that something new in sound effects comes out. Okay, and that, that was pretty cool. To we're me. all over the place here. Yeah, we are. Let's bring it back. Yes. We talked right. about Guillermo so del Toro. We <laughs> talked about, you know, 2013. What else you got for us, Dusty? The screenwriter is Travis Beecham, who is also known for the sequel to this movie, Uprising. Haven't seen it. Let's not talk about no, it. We're not going to. And also the horrible remake of the awesome 70s movie, Clash of the Titans. Wait, is that the one with Bring Out the Kraken? Yes. Un- yeah. Unleash the, the Kraken. And the lightsaber that's in Clash of the Titans. But it had Liam Neeson's. But it had a lightsaber. <laughs> Neeson's. But it's. But it had Liam Neeson. It was a horrible lightsaber. Okay. Like, literally, they stole a lightsaber and gave it to Perseus. 
I haven't seen it because no, it's horrible. And so is the sequel. <laughs> There's and, a sequel? Yes, there is. Yeah, not going to. Nope, nope, nope. And then the cinematography was uh, Guillermo Navarro, uh, who was also known for multiple episodes of the new Star Trek Discovery, which if you have a chance to watch it, it is beautiful. The Twilight series. You just mm. lost me. Yeah, I know. Uh, I am work number four. Work, man. Sometimes you just have to pay the mortgage. I am number four. It was okay. based yeah, off of yeah, a book. Yeah, yeah. And then the Hellboy series, Pan's Labyrinth, Zathura, A Space Adventure, Spy Kids, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which is one of my personal favorites. Wait, wait, wait. Is that Spy Kids and then The Long Kiss Goodnight? Or is yes. that Spy Kids? Spy Kids and The, the Long Kiss, kiss Goodnight. <laughs> because The Long Kiss Goodnight. I, that movie I'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Spy Kids was actually fairly entertaining. Yes. I watched it. As Never saw it. Yeah. Because, uh, the, because Danny Trejo was in it, and I wanted to... Fucking Danny Trejo, man. <laughs> I love that guy. Uh, the Long Kiss Goodnight, as I said, which is one of my personal favorites, and another personal favorite from Dusk Till Dawn. That's, That's some one. solid chops. Yeah, he's got uh, got some good stuff. The so, series is nowhere near So before I go movie, off on, uh, on just random tangents again, why don't you give us some more So some more initially... Folks. Uh, Taylor Kitchett of Friday Night Lights, Aaron Taylor Johnson, who ironically had gone on to play in Godzilla. These names mean nothing to me. Aaron Paul, people? who was in Breaking Bad, and Luke Bracey, who was in the Point Break remake, were all considered for parts of uh, Raleigh Beckett. I'm so out of it. They remade Point Break? Yeah, yeah. it was horrible. I don't know any of these people, uh, uh, but I know Charlie Hunnam because of Sons of Anarchy. Did you watch ever watch Breaking Bad? Nope. Okay, then. Uh, Stellan Skarsgård was considered for the role of Herc Hansen. I like him. And Tom Cruise was a, was originally considered for the part of Marshall that went uh, ultimately to Idris Elba. I'm glad because I don't think you can look up to Tom Cruise without no, Stellan. Idris fucking Elba yeah. is amazing. I, and I like Tom Cruise yeah. in some roles. I yeah, don't I like think... marathons and movies about running. Maybe about long distance running. What? You'll get it eventually. Chariots of Fire? What? <laughs> I don't know what you're It's about. an ongoing trope that Tom Cruise is only cast in movies where he has to run because that's his one really good uh, oh, okay. physical expression of okay. acting. It's where he runs really hard. But Ron Perlman. Come on. Ron Perlman's Ron shoes. Perlman. Oh, the Ron shoes. Perlman's shoes. So yeah. he kept the shoes. As he should. And then his wife had them melted down and turned them into like stiletto heels. Wait, 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 wait. Are we talking like real life? Yes. Ron Perlman's real life yes. wife? Yes, his real life wife. Are they still married? I have no clue. Because no. Yeah, he kept the shoes, the gold yeah. winged stirrup shoes. And then she took them and melted them down and turned them into high heels. Hey, Ron, leave her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those aren't yours. One of my favorite characters in the movie played by Charlie Day, Dr. Newt Geisler. I liked his partner better. I liked him too. I just yeah. I, I I liked Newt because there's a lot going on with Newt that the movie doesn't really go into that you have to but like if you if you do some digging you find out about like his parents are the ones that found out the the technology to 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 kill the the gaiju. Now that's cool, but none of this is in the movie. We're talking about the movie. I, I do want to talk about his partner. He was one of my favorite characters in the TV show Torchwood. I yes. was just fucking say that. Be faster, he boy. So good. <laughs> oh yeah. my god! Like that whole. All right, sorry. Torchwood. His, his Torchwood talk. moment. Torch Guys, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a Doctor Who spinoff. It's self-contained and it's so it's good. It darker. It's and it's much darker. Better. Yeah. Well. It's better than some of it. It's better than all of Doctor Who. And it Bite has... your tongue. It ha oh, I'm sorry. Doctor Who is bullshit. <gasps> but Torchwood is amazing. What I love about Torchwood... Well, you know what? I can go off about how much I love Torchwood. Torchwood is amazing. Doctor whatever Himmler. Yeah. I forget his name. He is one of the main Herman. characters, at least in the first two seasons of Torchwood. <laughs> Himmler? He was British. <laughs> he was... I thought Herman he was German. Gottlieb. Gottlieb. Yes. Oh, yeah, well, maybe, yeah. Okay. That's a very German that, name. No, no, no. You're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> With a limp. Yes. No, 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 a fake limp well, yeah, because he course. was spry climbing up yeah. and down that ladder, and then suddenly, oh, I need my cane. Wait, what? <laughs> anyway, he was great. Oh, I thought he was fantastic, yeah. and I love and that George actor. I want to see. I want to see more of him. He took me by surprise when he yeah. showed up. I was like, <gasps> it's yeah. him. Sorry, carry on. No, no, you blew me out of the water. Actually, I don't. I'm not going back to that part. <laughs> Glados like, was in this movie. Who's Neither of you are video gamers. I am. Uh, to an extent. Not, There's not... a game, a wonderful game, called Portal. 
Oh yes, I've oh, never played. I was Portal. gonna bring that up. And Portal has an insane, murderous computer system named Glados. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. They got the voice actress of Glados to play the voice of the computer in Pacific Rim. Yeah, uh, her name is Ellen McLean, and she plays it exactly nope. like Glados. Nope, it no, sounds no. nope, 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 nope. They had to tweak it a little bit because of rights. Well, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm a fan. I know you're you a fan. You may say that they tweaked it, but it was obvious to no, anyone listening that that was GLaDOS. The similarity is both undeniable and deliberate, but the but Del, the Del Toro did change a few minor characteristics, so it did not walk over Portal, even he though might, they he, even though they gave permission. He changed just enough to meet copyright requirements. Yeah, so it's still like, but it was fucking Glados. It, yeah, it is Glados. It's the same <laughs> woman. Anybody yeah, who's, anybody who watches, who is a fan of Portal. You listen to her talk, and she speaks with the same cadence. She has the same. I always feel bad that I haven't yeah. played Portal. Because it, it's such a part of like my end of video gaming culture, but I just I've never gotten around to it. Neither have I. It's, I've seen it. It's beautiful, but I've never gotten around to it. Yeah, you play it sometime. I, I have I, it. I have it. Yeah, just, <laughs> I mean, just play it sometime. I won't speak any more about it. You should play it and experience it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I like the recruitment speech where he's getting done with welding and he's he's picked up by the helicopter. Do you want to die here? Do you want to die in a big fucking robot yeah. punching monsters? That makes perfect <laughs> sense to me. It's like, well, let's see. I could die as one of a faceless crowd of squishies, or I could get into a giant fucking robot. Yeah, it's a little old, a little outdated, and punch something in the snoot. I, I liked like, his answer. Punch something in the snoot. Life I, lesson. Always punch something in the snoot. I do actually have a question for you specifically, Matthew. Yes. As our resident man of the sea. Do you have any thoughts on that ship scene at the beginning? Uh, the little fishing boat? Yeah. Yeah, no one has ever called the captain sir on a boat that size. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about the second ship scene in the movie? Uh, he couldn't have picked it up by the end without the thing snapping in half. That's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Matthew, you're welcome. Man of the sea. <laughs> no, I mean, a boat has to be very carefully supported before it's dropped in water or the thing snaps in half. He definitely couldn't hit have hit it five times. No, you couldn't shit. have even picked it up. <laughs> it would have been nunchucks. <laughs> Which would have been kind of cool too. I could see that. <gasps> oh dear lord. Pacific Rim 3. <laughs> Turtle power. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back, Michelangelo. But that was that was one thing that I was oh I was wondering God. about in this in this movie is because they're obviously designed to have one power weapon. E- each different type of Jaeger has mm-hmm. one different type of power weapon, and everyone basically just punches. Beyond that, punches, throws, grapples. Why aren't there with more the one power melee weapon. weapons? I disagree with the one power weapon because I love that word. But here, I'll hear you out. Because they had the plasma cannon on her arm. Uh huh on its arm and then they had the sword so I, that's two power weapons that was unique though the every everyone should have gone into that with a melee weapon ready you're going to be grappling with these things now if you're going up against something that's much bigger and much tougher than you i don't know maybe a spear even a big ass stick i i would have to go into that about knowing that the that getting that into that close quarters of of combat knowing that the Arm robots spikes. are much slower than the gaiju. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you would want to have something like a, a very long pole arm. Yeah, Eat better something. than elbow rockets. Even Evangelion in that anime, they had knives. They had big ass robot knives that popped out of their leg. I yeah, mean, they should have had melee weapons. Like if, if I was going to fight these things in a giant mech, I would get a boar fighting spear, which is, you know, you poke it in the end. And then it comes up to a cross guard, and they can't push along the spear at you. If and was, then you just charge up whatever your weapon is and blow it all to shit. If I was going to fight these things, I wouldn't do it with manned robots. I'd do it with drones. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it in the ocean either. Well, there's no people there. That's probably the best place to fight them. That's literally the best place to fight them. Shut up. I wasn't thinking. <laughs> I would go with satellites with mass drivers. Oh, look, we have a problem there. Fucking the slug of depleted uranium right. comes down through the atmosphere and boom! No, nope, not even that. Let's just drop a fucking anvil from space. Mm-hmm. Boom. Yeah, it's, everything around it is vaporized. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that doesn't also make for much of a movie beyond, like, Duck Hunt. 
which we expect in 2020. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> As they're running out of video game franchises. Oh, God. It's going to happen, too. You know it. Yeah, there was the Emoji movie. I, 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 I think Duck Hunt is a very real possibility, and I want writing credit. And they're going to bring in the Duck Dynasty guys, too, because <laughs> oh they God. have to. Because that's how we are now. Thanks. If this ever survives to a future generation, if this podcast is one of the last surviving relics of humanity, I'm sorry for Duck Hunt, the movie. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm sure if you go out on YouTube, there's probably a fan film called Duck Hunt. I want to go on record as saying Mako, Newt, and Herman are the best actors outside of Ron Perlman, which I didn't put in because he only had a bit part. Ron- yeah, Ron Perlman, uh, yeah, he doesn't have a big enough part. I, I mean, I love him, Elba but... Great. It's he- just Elba. He he was, but he didn't he didn't strike me as a PC either. Well, that doesn't you don't have to be a PC. I don't think that uh, Herman and whatever were PCs. I, I do actually. We, we I, ju- I just think PCs. they were the scientist type if, in the if, game I'm thinking of. Okay, well, if you're gonna make them PCs, then we got to make Stringer Bell and the the Australian slash Irish accent kid. Oh, oh I know, God. right? Where they kept <laughs> flipping back and forth. They also have to be PCs. I can just cross that one right because off. Because NPCs don't make heroic sacrifices in an RPG. That's yeah. the PC's role. Yeah. But I think that Stringer Bell was actually, I keep calling him Stringer Bell because of the wire, but Idris Elba was amazing in his role. And my favorite moment, my absolute favorite moment of him was when he gives Jax Teller the dressing down and Jax, he basically makes him call him sir. But then he turns his head. Oh, yes. Points at his ear. It's like, say that in yeah. my ear, motherfucker. But he doesn't say it. He just points. He does. He it does so angry, good. barely, he's barely a, leashed rage exceedingly <laughs> he's, well. He's got a good role for intimidation. He he does. His facial expressions are minimal and they tell everything you need to know. He can just yeah. simply twitch an eye and slightly curl a cheek. Yeah, he studied the like the yeah. Jeremy Brett school of acting. Yeah, he is. Stringer uh, Idris Elba is one of my favorite. <laughs> you you have to watch The Wire. He is a character named Stringer Bell, mm-hmm. and he's amazing. I like the oh your scars are so sexy looking through the doorway. Oh you saw me run. <laughs> oh my god, that was horrible. <laughs> this is my room. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the good thing with that was, I mean, <laughs> so like when we say there was no. There was no nothing beyond like platonic back and forth. I I don't think that's necessarily true. Well, even even in Master and Commander, we talked about that longing look, you know, from the captain to the uh, mm-hmm. uh, to the to the native, and then there was nothing after that. So yeah. the stories, though, but the the pilots, the smaller stories of the pilots, actually make the bigger point of the movie, which is that we're all together in the same robot which is this is kind of what i took from the movie that the robot is supposed to be life and either we get along or we all die i'm down with that yeah 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 yeah. okay i don't i don't like the drift itself because i don't see why it's necessary i i kind of anyone else i mean it's a it's a good storytelling plot yeah it's it's, a good plot movement but like as as a writer also i i just don't, don't see a logical if, reason why there are too many questions that come in with using a device like that yeah. and you don't have enough screen time to explain how it works now in a novel format you could go into like the science behind it sure but in a movie it's like in looper i uh, mean we're 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 upright bipeds yeah looper using there, half of that is going to throw you looper there's a there's a part in looper where um, the younger version of Bruce Willis's character says, time travel, how did we figure that out? And the the way they got, the writers got out of that was Bruce Willis replying, it, uh, it's science, don't worry about it. That's how they got, got around that. That's kind of something that would be done for this movie. But I would like to see the background with that. I would too. It's actually a fairly interesting world. It reminds me, I'm sorry again, of John Ringo's Into the Looking Glass. Um which is gates open and giant monsters pour through in waves. Okay. Um, and that's all it is. And it's great. Uh, it's they, they explore a little bit of the things that he also explores in his novelizations. And it's, it's actually a fairly rich ground mm-hmm. to explore, especially when you're dealing with not only alien, but extra dimensional, which I, they use the word dimension twice. So I'm not, I'm not going with far away in that direction. But at a tangent in that direction with our own space time. Yeah. 
So and if you could see Matthew's arms, one was going up, one yeah, the other. Um, and it's uh, I, I they did that with a couple lighting effects when they went in there, so you could see it was a different dimension. Everything was hazy and everything had light flare. But um, I, I I like that the aliens aren't just from far away in the universe. That they are, because you can tie a lot into that. You can. If you want to play with extra dimensionally. And they mentioned that that they were here before with the dinosaurs. But and, that, and that we've can, basically terraformed our planet for them. Yeah, but conditions weren't right for them at that time. So, I mean, that, that actually gives you a long history to play with and a rich, fertile ground to fuck around with, which I really like. And if you look at the subtext with that, it's very apparent where Del Toro was going. It's basically, we're fucking our own planet up. Stop doing that. And he did it so subtly. Yes, very subtly. <laughs> that was a little ham-handed. Yeah. That was kind Rah. of that, um. <laughs> that was like that was like fucking Fern Gully politics. Right oh there. My it was God. pretty bad. Yes. One thing that in rewatching this, Tim Curry should have sang a song. You're right. <laughs> For this movie, that would have been great. <laughs> what? It's just Fern Gully. It's all right. Perfect. <laughs> Don't dream it. Be it. <laughs> Not that song. Rewatching this movie, I <laughs> one thing that, that that bugged me was that if if the if the pilots are supposed to be uh, telepathically linked, why did they have to yell to each other what what they were doing? Other than I mean, shh, <laughs> don't look behind the curtain. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot of it, but it was maybe giant staying, robots hitting giant monsters. Maybe and staying okay. focused or military background. I could maybe see that. You know, that, no, but... I agree it, but if you have a telepathic link, then all of a sudden language becomes irrelevant. Yeah. It just becomes irrelevant. You don't need it anymore. And if you're you're linked, you mean you're going to know what you're yeah, what the yeah, other's yeah, doing. Hold on. But what if that link is analog? Oh, I know, right? <laughs> that thing was fucking digital all the way. She's analog. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> No, no. Shut up, Jax. Tell her you do not know anything about anything. They should have just gone with old and we used a lot of lead paint on her and that shielded from the EMP. That, that thing was not analog. My, no. point, my point with that being it's movie logic. Yeah. yeah. Sort of giant robots. Analog monsters. with holographic screens in front of you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like... When I was busy yelling at the at the screen after like the sixth fist fight, going, "Why is there no Voltron sword?" They pull out the Voltron sword, and that made me very happy. When I saw this movie in the theater, that moment made me squeal with excitement. When the sword came out, I was like, "God, yeah!" And people sitting around me looked at me like I was weird. I'm like, "Fuck you, this fucking sword!" You know, I'm happy. <laughs> I got something to say about movie swords, and I'm I'm gonna. I may have said something similar in the past, so I'll okay, keep it I concise. I will preempt you here and say Go. that that wasn't really a sword. That was, it was just sort a blade. It was like a, a chain sword. Blade. They called it. Yeah. yeah, and they just it just interlaced back together. I on don't itself. understand why. Why? Beyond looking cool, why? Depleted uranium. Pour it into a mold. Put an edge on it. Stab the thing. That is unnecessary. I want to know why they, I mean, I know why they dumped it for story effect because it, it froze one of them or part of them. Why they, that was venting gas. No, they the don't No, I know, but they also dumped all their coolant. Yeah. They should have gone into meltdown like right then, right? Yes. It have isn't... you ever run an engine without antifreeze? It gets real hot real fast. Yeah. When? Uh, there's a KG fight. They're in the ocean. It's a, with the, with they're the wings. Right, it's they're a, right the, on it, and the tail's nailing them. Oh, the tail yeah. mouth, I think and they he's dumped like, all their coolant because they were vastly underwater in the frozen depths of the ocean. No, it no, was, no it, they it were above. above the they, were, they were in air. Really? Yeah. Oh. And, yeah. They, and they were using Dump it the as coolant. a freeze thing. And it froze it so they could crush it. All I gotta say is that movie logic. Giant monsters punching <laughs> there you go. robots and vice versa. The desk toy was nice. What is that thing called? It has like an old philosopher scientist name, the balls that you drop one and the other one goes and it's a desk toy from like the oh, early nineties. Uh, Newton's testicles. That, yes. Yeah, well not testicles. But, <laughs> but I like that better. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a good moment where yes. the, the, the arm is smashing through the office block. Everything, 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 and then beep. That that scene right there was all practical. That okay. was all done on 3D printers, and then they brought in this big 
metal arm type thing to go through everything, and then they just went in a digitally made. That, that, that was arm. very nice. Yes. And as with most things, when I see a practical effect, I love it. So much of the movie logic happened in the scenes where the doctor brain merged drifted with the kaiju brain and it just showed this vague scenes of things and suddenly the doctor knows everything i've seen this movie now five times and i've actually poured over those the drift i scenes. pause yeah. too i tell sh- you nothing yeah nothing at all it's suddenly like okay i've connected drift 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 scene 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 flash 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 now i know everything wait what how what how Okay, whatever, there whatever. Was, was Robots no, punching monsters. There was I'm no okay. thing of like them yeah. marching up to the gate. It was just, it was too yeah. vague. Was too I'm kind of curious on how Ron Perlman's character drifted with the brain because he he alluded to himself doing that also, and what? that's why he with it with his eye. Remember when he went to go see him, and Charlie Day's character he admitted that he had drifted with it, and then he said later on because I've done it too. Did he? Yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember yeah. that. And that's why when he pulled down his sunglasses, that's you a see scar. His, it goes. I over know his... because well because he looked at Charlie Day's eye and he could see that it was all. That's what when, when it was all messed up. He said you 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 connected with it, and that's when he went on that tangent of you asshole. That's a hive mind. Why would you do that? And they're now searching for you. And then he turns and he pulled pulls his glasses and he said because I tried it also. I'm just kind of say that because I'm kind of remember cur- that line. How did you guys miss that? Because I, I don't think it happened. It did. I watched it today. No, it was it was a scar. Like that was a knife wound. That wasn't a. And he said because I tried it also. But I, how, he didn't. But have he the didn't. Technology. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm what, what I'm wondering about how he drifted. If the it. it I don't think he did. I think it's, we, we were done because I, I still have it up on my crazy, laptop. Dude. We'll we'll go back and watch that that scene. I like it when. Uh, the the son calls her a bitch and he stands oh, up yeah. for her honor. I thought that was unnecessary, especially since she's already proved she's the better fighter. But I, I, I found that completely unnecessary that he stands up for her honor and does the fight fight. I did not expect Aussie Irish guy to be to die. Yeah. When I first watched the movie. I was glad he did. I, well, yeah. Oh, the kid. He was a douche, but I didn't expect it. I totally, at the very beginning of the movie, when I first saw it, I saw Stringer Bell and it's like, he's going to die. I saw the old man and thought he was going to die. And I immediately thought, who's going to take care of that adorable bulldog? But (laughs) I totally expected the kid to live on and we carry on the legacy and the old men to kind of, you know, do the whole old ass cowboys going into the rift. I liked, uh, I like that nothing, nothing happened with his his father afterwards after his kid's dead. Like, no discernible emotion. Didn't really seem all that torn was, up about it. it did you did you catch the subtext with uh, between you know the father, the son, and the dog? Did you happen to catch that at all? Since you brought what up the dog, Max, beyond the the patch. Uh, no, the dog actually served as a as a uh, a conduit between the father and the son because they had such. And he, uh, in a hard time emotionally dealing with each other, but they I both love the think dog that's so giving much. Too much credit. I like no, it. No, I'm actually, the screenwriter. It's, it's, talk- it's an old Shakespearean oh, no. ploy. The screenwriter even talked about using the dog as a conduit for the father and son. That's too much. It's an old Shakespearean ploy. You have a bit with the dog. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a trope okay. from the 1700s. Well, I understand I mean, that, but it was neat to see. I liked it. 1800s. It's a trope from whatever, and this is robots punching monsters. <laughs> Just say it, Matthew. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, is that we're looking for too much meaning in there. I think he cobbled that together afterwards. I, you know, if the screenwriter said it's, it, whatever. Yeah. You know. I, I'm Full of poo. To give it to him because it was an adorable bulldog. And I, I didn't get so enough much. Ron Perlman. I was like, I, I even wrote down, Ron fucking Perlman, Did exclamation you point. the credits? No. And then, you Ron Perlman, no. You didn't watch the credits? No, because we were supposed to be doing something else afterwards, and I immediately shifted over to that. But have you, you've seen it before, right? Yeah. Did you watch it through the credits? No, it's not a Marvel movie. Why would I? <laughs> because Ron Perlman has a scene at the end of the credits. <sighs> Fuck. We'll be right back. <laughs> <hit the thing. laughs> he basically carves his way out of the body. Atta boy. Pops his head out and says, where's my goddamn shoe? <laughs> his wife got it. No, it's yeah. down. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Did sorry, you know Ron. that a uh, hundred kaiju's and a hundred Jaegers were designed, but only a fraction of them actually appeared in the movie? Every week, the filmmakers had held a vote for their favorites, and, and the crew 
and everybody involved, those that that had the higher votes were put in the movie. I, I like it's that. a shame that the ones that they put in the movie didn't even get enough backstory. The Russians. You see the Russians like three times on screen and then they die. The Chinese. Amazing. I want to know more about their technique. I want to know more Especially about them. Especially in a two hour and 15 minute long yeah. movie. Yeah. You had the time. You had the time. You spent all of it on Jax Teller and Mako Mori and Stringer Bell. Yeah. What about the rest? I wanted to know more about them. Maybe, I liked maybe a couple Netflix scenes. Will do a series. The the oh, destroyed God, city and the little girl's red shoe. That's good storytelling. That is. That's that's like the red balloon style storytelling. That's good stuff. I have a question for you because you're uh, you're really big into it. What did you think about the foley for this movie? Um, um the sound. How just, much of it was foley? Well, just the sound in general. I I mean, I I really liked the uh, the into the bathtub sound. Foley is pretty much all sound added afterwards that creates the scene. Yeah, so. but a lot of it wasn't like fully fully. A lot of it was oh, your yeah, computer yeah. generated sounds. I mean, honestly, I I listened to it with big ass speakers. It sounded great. I I didn't have any complaints. Um, yeah, <laughs> the sound of the roars was comprised of multiple layers of animal roars and growls that had been filtered, sped up, and then slowed down to create this like alien behemoth sound. And then to add emotion and a sense of intelligence, the supervising sound editor, Scott Gershon and Del Toro, added samples of their own voices of screaming. <laughs> All right, I have a question. Why doesn't his escape pod have die markers? Have what? Die markers. I don't know what those are. When her escape pod surfaces, a green die goes out into the ocean. Ah. Okay. When his escape pod surfaces, fuck him. Well, when <laughs> hers is the guy. surfaces, we see it immediately happen. When his surfaces, it was malfunctioning. To, That's true. It is yeah. malfunctioning, and time is spent with her swimming over there. I the guy could have popped up. No, nah, because hers was still there. Okay. I still need thermonuclear resistant <laughs> die markers. <laughs> okay, <it's> just <laughs> we're running long on this, guys. Do you have any last words for the movie segment? Die markers. I'm done. Okay, die markers. My, uh, Dusty, I I had some history <laughs> for the for the. Uh, the World War II nod to the Jaeger, but I'm not. I'm not going to go into it. Panzer Jaeger, go on. And today, my friends, is our Independence Day. It. It. The cadence was exactly the same. Yeah. I just. Oh, I just felt it coming. Anyway, let's take this to the gaming table. Okay, we'll be right back. I got to pee. This very special episode of Half Movies Will Game is brought to you by our hosts this week. Uh, we've spent the entire weekend here at the Wagon Con convention, my new personal favorite convention of all time. And we have with us right now Aaron Bowman, who hey. is one of the directors uh, and hosts of this convention. And Aaron, tell us a little bit about how Wagon Con got started. Actually, Wagon Con started at GameStorm. Uh, we were driving home down the gorge, Matt Buckley, who's one of the other. Uh, co-chairs of this convention and we were just talking about the amazing gamers that we actually have in our community but a lot of them due to circumstances work or money could not make it to game storm so i planted the seed in matt's head that's my job uh <laughs> to say hey man we could do our own amazing convention in the dalles and he was like kind of brushed me off matt's a good brush off kind of person so he's like yeah dude sounds good and he drove a year later, Matt calls me and it's like, I've got this amazing idea. We're going to do a con <laughs> in the Dallas. And it's like, you son of a bitch. I told you a year ago we should do this. But that's kind of the genesis of how the convention started. And then we got other great people aboard. And it's just been three years of awesome. Nice. This is my first year here. And I've just been introduced to it by uh, Nathaniel, old NPC here. Um, I had a blast. Awesome. And there is all kinds of fantastic swag here. Yes. Um, Heck yeah. What What do you see uh, going forward in the future? What are What are your plans for the future of the con? Tomorrow, we're all going to die. <laughs> 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 and we're going to sleep for like a week. Uh, each year, we seem to grow by 25%. Mm -hmm. And what's great is we do no, no advertising whatsoever. It is all word of mouth. It is all awesome gamers talking to other awesome gamers. That's kind of what our convention is about. Super positive. We don't do jerks. Uh, like I said, we have a rendition policy. People disappear from our convention if they're jerks. Uh, you know, we um, so we try to keep that going. So for next year, 
super positive, awesome gaming people. Um, we're going to expand as we always do. We've brought on two new board members this year, which is exciting because we had the same three people kind of doing it for the last three years, and we're all really burnt. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, something this yeah, big, and so. you only have three people doing it. You you kind of want to have some new blood, and the two people we got are phenomenal. Uh, so we are going to expand in new amazing ways, and we're excited about mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I've also like in, in concrete terms, I, I heard a rumor about maybe a stage next year. Is that, um, is that a thing? Uh, it's not more than a rumor. We're putting it out to the universe, and okay. we're making it happen. That's awesome. how this works. I like that. So uh, this is my first time here, so yeah. thank you. I've really enjoyed it. There, it's great to see so many gamers in a in a good place, all getting along so well and having fun. So thank yeah. you for for everything. Oh so, man, great to have you. Those that aren't uh, have never been to this con or or don't know much about it, or they're they're also learning through word of mouth. Uh, if they want to get more information on Wagon Con, where would they where would they go on the interwebs or? Yeah, great question. Two different places. We have a great Facebook presence. It's kind of the quickest, easiest way to update people on what's going on. But also we have WaganCon.com. It's how you buy your tickets. It's how you purchase your swag and everything. But we do a lot of updates, Mm -hmm. even throughout the year, not even close to con. We always like to keep convention goers involved. We want them to feel a part of it. Uh, So we're always like, hey, here's a picture of our board meeting and we get like 60 likes for a picture of a board meeting. That's how cool these (laughs) convention goers are. They're just like, sweet (laughs) sweet your planning. Yeah, so it's just awesome. Yeah, Facebook or WaganCon.com. Excellent. Yeah. That's good. And if you want to send us an email, which we get a lot of this, it's WaganCon at gmail.com. So send us an email if you have any questions. We're really quick about replying, so... Well, thanks again for hosting us and letting us come here and take up a whole lot of space. With oh, yeah. You guys Thank you great. so much. It's oh, been amazing. You guys had an you. amazing weekend. Love having you. Well, let's bring this movie to the gaming table. Dusty, tell us about the characters in this movie. All right. We're going to start off with Charlie Hunnam, who plays Raleigh Beckett, the scrappy pilot who has the lost his brother in the early part of the movie and has to come back and give it another another college try. <laughs> Are we doing alignments? Yes. Lawful good. Charlie Hunnam? Yeah, I think he's chaotic. lawful good. I would say chaotic. I so. don't see him break any rules. Well, no. I mean, he didn't necessarily break any rules, but he was... He was <sighs> this is going to be tough for me. I didn't really get a sense that he followed the rules so much. I think that the writers kind of wanted to brand him as something of a, a wild child. You can't do that, Maverick. You just that. can't buzz the tower. He was basically Maverick in a giant robot. Yeah. But uh, I don't know about that. Th- it's, you can't get away from that because it sells. But as as the character in the movie, despite what I'm used to the character being, I didn't see him disobey. No, he didn't. He I got, he, he was got, on, he was also honor bound. Yeah, I, I didn't see him like he went out and he continued to do what work he could on the wall. After he was unable to work in a Jaeger, he kept working towards his goal in whatever way he could, and then he came back. He did disobey orders to save that boat. Yeah, but that would that would ethos. drop him into a different alignment category. That's like a one time thing. Again, this is the failing of the Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, unless he was to stab someone or All kill right. them. I would still say, call him scrupulous, then. I would put him as unprincipled. Scrupulous. Uh, okay, I'll go with scrupulous. He was scrupulous, which is like a neutral good. Yeah, but, I mean, honestly, in, in pure D&D, I'm going to go with lawful good. He was he was the the protagonist, which is mainly, and he was he was an everyman type. He frequently broke ranks in order to do what he thought was better. So I'll say neutral good. All right. That yeah, was lawful good. I agreed with that. Okay. Then we have Idris Elba playing Marshall Stacker Pentecost. Neutral good. Lawful good. If not lawful neutral. He was all about order. He did not do any. He He rarely broke out of that order. And when he did... It was only because he had this, let's just say, his protege that he wanted to protect or in some way enable. He was lawful. Uh, I'm gonna, I, you know lawful. what? I'll, I'll change. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think I'm going to go with neutral good. No, I, 
I will say lawful good, but not neutral. He was no. all about order. He was the most orderly no, you're person right. in the whole fucking movie. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll change. But he was doing the best that he could do with the given circumstances. You know, he worked in the <laughs> My system. telling moment with him was with the boat. There was no reason for them not yeah. to rescue the boat. But, but he told them not to. Yeah, but he told them not to. And then when they were already there, he had them bring it back. Which he was finally like, okay, grab the boat. Let's yeah, go. The, I think yeah. that was the telling moment for alignment with his character. Yeah. And you're right. That is that was a lawful good move. I think if okay. he were neutral, he would have told them to go for the boat initially. Yeah. 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 All right. Then we have Rinko Kikuchi as Mako Mori. Neutral good. You think? Why? Because this is the one that I think law. Like, she took his word every time. She but was she, obedient. But she bucks against it. She bucks. She, she. Your oh, feelings God. are irrelevant. Your actions are what matter. It's not. No, it's your feelings that matter. Oh, God, actually. I'm fucked. <laughs> your, she was. I just dropped into neutral evil, people. <laughs> no, that can't be right. I have to take a stand you against that. You Because if it is, ignore, I'm fucked. No, it's a mix of both. You cannot ignore the feelings. Oh, it's a shit. Matter yes, of you how can. You, you have to. Oh, oh darn. It's how you feel versus how you act, and you have to balance between them. She she heavily bucked against I wake the up each morning play, praying for a meteor. I have to believe. <laughs> the feelings don't matter. She didn't so much conform to authority as she conformed to him. That was like, he was her guidepost, Idris Elba. I see what you're saying, but I don't know that I agree with it because of her interactions on every with everyone else. A lot, a lot of bowing, a lot of, uh, I mean, some, some of that's cultural. But, I mean, the culture that she it was putatively, you know, coming from, is a very orderly, lawful okay. culture. Oh, okay. I'll go with lawful good. Okay. Yeah. She's definitely good. Yeah. I mean, that, no that's question not, that's about no it. Doubt. The lawful and the neutral, somewhere in between in, in, D, in Palladium, I'd put her as scrupulous as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we have Charlie Day as Newt Geisler, and I'm going to say right off the bat, chaotic neutral. Wait, what? wait. Which, he neutral? Was, he was the, the he was mind meld. Mind yeah. meld? Yeah. Chaotic good. Chaotic good? I'm going to say yeah. neutral. Yeah, I'm with he, Nathaniel. He did his own thing, and he wasn't. He was wasn't going. That he was, was going against good the moment. rules, and he was going against everything else. He did but, his. But own why was thing. he doing it? For the greater good, but there he still go. went against all the rules. That's, that's why he's chaos. chaotic. But that's the not good the, is the good is the intention. The, the chaos is the method. All right, we're making a sign. Yeah, we're just going to make a sign <laughs> and we're going to post it right there of what the D and D definitions are, and we can put Palladium right next to it. Dusty, when was the last time you read the D and D alignments? It's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while <laughs> since you read alignments. And because honestly, the games that I get involved in, it <laughs> never really fucking comes up. You are the only GM that I have ever underscore italicized bold neon that shit all the way around blinking font with yes. sparkly letters <laughs> that, <laughs> say, is there brings, a hyperlink? that brings in alignment only if the game enforces it most so, games like savage worlds doesn't have alignment so just fucking go wild but D, you get alignments you know yeah you stick with it and then we have burn gorman <laughs> <laughs> dr sorry. herman gottlieb my favorite character and some amazing acting. Honestly, lawful good. Yeah. Yeah. He believed in the true word of mathematics. Yep. I can agree with that. Yeah. There we go. All right. And he stood by his friend. So yeah. definitely. Which is good. always good. Yeah. Probably one of the best last names ever. Max Martini as Hercules Herc Hansen. Lawful good. Which one Very was lawful that? Good. That was the dad. That was, that the, was dad. the dad? That was the dad. Very lawful good. Yeah. Especially with the apology scene. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, right. He was doing his best to clean up after his son's yep. fuck-ups. And then his son, Robert Kaczynski, chaotic played Chuck good. Hansen. Yeah, chaotic yeah. good. He's All a right. dick, but he had his, yeah, that he had his make heart in evil. the right place yeah. in the end. Yeah. yeah. And then we have to bring in the ra the great Ron Perlman as <sighs> Hannibal Child. I gotta say, as much as I love fucking Ron Perlman, and I much as I love the character, that was that was a vendor quest giver. Oh yeah, that that, that was, was a vendor. That was an, yeah. that was an NPC. I but I loved I loved his line. I got my name from my two favorite people, Hannibal <laughs> and the and the Chinese restaurant down on the street. Yeah, that was pretty good. Honestly, 
as a GM, you still give your NPCs alignments if you want them to be interesting. And for him, I would say chaotic neutral. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, neutral. Straight fucking neutral. True neutral. I don't know, man. He was not chaotic in any way. He had a system. He had his methods. Yeah. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't nuts. He wasn't disorganized. He had a system. He, then he why won't you go lawful neutral? Numero uno, because he bucked against authority, you know? He worked underneath the system. I mm-hmm. would go straight up neutral. He was all about, okay, again, this is D&D. If this were palladium, <laughs> I would say aberrant, if not anarchist. I'd say aberrant because he brokered a deal with the putative government. I'm using putative a lot today. I don't he know also why. put that guy out to his death. So, yeah, I would say aberrant. Yeah, but he was little and he yelled a lot. But whatever. <laughs> it's like, I don't it was care. annoying. Yeah. Somewhere between aberrant and anarchist. Yeah. All right. That that rounds out the main part of the cast that we would actually put into if we were to game it. So you have a game. Matthew, you have a Matthew. story to tell. You have I a think hook? that was everyone. Yep. I'm trying to think back. That's it for the main characters. Yeah. yeah. The bulldog. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna Neutral say sweet. his 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 <laughs> guy his guy in the control room that was also an NPC. Yeah, to, that's that's why I didn't add him. Although he was very, it was a great character. Yeah, limited lines, but the character itself was great. But he, yeah, total NPC. My hook is called Earth. Welcome to the neighborhood. Humanity doesn't and never has taken threats of invasion well. We tend to respond directly and roughly yes. and with overpowering force. The big old middle fingers and dicks waving in the air. Yep. The direct link from the kaiju dimension was severed at the end of the movie, but the uh, kaiju collective knows how to reestablish the gate. Jaegers go into full production to prepare for the invasion of the kaiju dimension. Three years pass. Here's where the PCs come in. That's just history. Okay. The PCs will start as cadets, preparing to learn to pilot their Jaegers. They will prepare, struggle, and learn the arts in a game, uh, in an in-game boot camp, followed by, hopefully, a graduation. But right as they graduate, indeed, at the ceremony itself, the gate reopens. Yes. Kaiju, 30 of them. (laughs) Pour through. Headed for Hong Kong and Seattle, respectively, in an even split 15 and 15. Wait, 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 wait. wait. How many? 30. We're fucked. (laughs) No. No. Uh, Heading for Hong Kong and Seattle. What class? Uh, Four. Wait. At this point, there are 30 Jaegers. As well, with more being built at the rate of one a week. This wow. is a, a world. This is a world that system. That likes Jaegers. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. Well, they're, I'm, I'm assuming they're being chewed through still. Yes. So, uh, the new crew of raw pilots must learn, fight, and contain this new threat. This new threat. The story arc for this, for this is for DMZ ears only, uh, <laughs> is is thus. Uh, here's your setting. Humanity learns from their previous mistakes with the Jaegers and their defense platforms. Massive gun emplacements cover the rift. Very important. Geosynchronous mass driver satellites cover for flying uh, uh, kaijus. Um, Fleets of submersibles and Jaeger cover the underwater approaches from the rift. The kaiju are met with overwhelming force at every emergence. Not just one per fucking... If you have three and two come out, you send all three. The more you use, the less you lose. That's old, old military wisdom. You might burn through some fuel, but you're yeah. going to make up yeah, for it. And, and the lack of you don't deaths. have to build another Jaeger. So the PCs have just graduated. The alarm bells ring. The PCs will take a tertiary role in this, their first defense. This is your, there are rats in the basement of the inn. Go down and kill them because we can't get at the ale. We got some class ones yeah. you need to take out. They're basically playing outfielders. They will have a minor combat to blood them. As their comrades fall over the successive months uh, that follow, they'll be promoted to squad leaders, then company leaders. Though, assuming they survive, they will move up in in the command structure of the Jaegers, which you're just going to probably have to make up on the fly. Then the kaiju open the gate nonstop. Hundreds pour in, and the battle will begin in earnest. Humanity will struggle to supply ammo, downtime, and basic repairs for the defenses and pilots but it can be done in a true worldwide effort. This can be contained. Then the word finally comes down. We've had enough. We're losing too much of our resources. Invade the kaiju dimension. Don't blow up the rift. Yeah. Let's go get them. Quit fucking around. They invade. Devil horns. 
we pour the entire resources down into this hole in the ocean. Oh my and God, we invade. We, is this a robot dungeon crawl? Wait a sec. Yes! After defeating the kaiju, which, you know, I'm pro-humanity. We're going to do it. Yeah. Um, after that, what it turns out... What have you been pro-humanity? I am pro. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> I am I am in public spaces. Uh, <laughs> after that, it turns out that the kaiju don't control a single gate, but they control a tunable dimensional nexus, what? which means the whole of creation like is now accessible to a tired, warlike, and blood-soaked humanity. I like this. What will the PCs do? Ba -ba -ba -ba. And that's my game hook. It's a very long one. This is not a standalone. This is a campaign. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like an amazing conclusion to an awesome campaign. I like it. I really like it. I think that in a situation like this, the DM should be ready for some gimmies. Um, because define, define gimmies. Uh, the gimme as in leave them a way out. Because this arc is going to be hard for someone to rebuy into. Okay. Like if a player falls, they'd obviously start as another cadet. As opposed to someone of, of the level of everyone else. Have you ever played a game where you had a group of players who had main characters and then side characters? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've played with you on that. Yeah. So the idea being that side characters were kind of nurtured as not necessarily NPCs. <laughs> nurtured as somewhere between the level of NPCs and PCs. They became characters that the party basically controlled or uh if you've ever played video games like yeah. the suikoden series or the shining force series or any of those where you had backup characters that were hanging out at the base waiting to be used yeah yeah that could work for something like that you, where you, you have these you could do that but i i saw this being played with one system and i'll let you do the reveal on that and on that it just takes so long it doesn't have to, though. Yeah, but it, if you want to use all the expanded world that they haven't pulled into the new way of doing it yet, it does. Okay, okay. Um, and it's the way I really want to learn to play it. Um, so I saw this as this, this would have to be not, not a, a TPK kind of DM. It's not, it's not an adversarial DM okay. looking to get the party, which is a, a form. Like, Hackmaster is brilliant at that. But the GM has to be willing to allow for heroic sacrifice. Yeah. Oh, of course. That that adds to the gaiety of nations. That's just that's just good storytelling. Absolutely. But um, but this this should not be uh, a charnel house event. The charnel house should be going on in the background. It, it the PC should not be facing it directly. Well, let's hit some themes of this. And these are the themes that are directly connected to both your follow-up and the movie that we've been talking about. Let's start from the end, Death. This is a movie that if we were to make it into a proper gaming experience based on the movie, we need to have an opportunity, an avenue for heroic death. Mm -hmm. Which I love personally. The, yeah, characters... the final strike concept, I've always been a huge fan of it. But and not I, even the final strike, just the character who can die mid-story. The sacrifice. To carry the story I on. I love that. Either to carry the story on, I should say, or to end the story in a dramatic way. So we want a, a game system that allows that. We want, I know as you say, the system that we're probably both thinking of doesn't <laughs> on the surface <laughs> allow for that, but I've got an idea. Okay. But we want a system that can, we want a, a gaming system that can allow for characters to just die and be replaced by someone new or to bring in somebody who's already been mentioned to, at the last minute, fill their spot. Oh, no, the bulldog has died. We must bring in the poodle or something like that. It has to be a thing where... Now we've got to change our unit patches. And when we go out drinking, the girls are not going to fuck us if we have the poodle on our patch. I'm just saying. Well, it's, it doesn't have to point. be a groomed poodle. It can be a fierce poodle. Arr! And poodles can be fierce, my friend. <laughs> poodles are like the Diet Coke of fierce. Okay. Again, <laughs> you must know different poodles than I do. <laughs> that was pretty good, Dusty. Thank that was you. all right. <laughs> I have a, a, every once in a while, I have them. I want to stop dancing, though. I, and I, I agree with your point, but can we just 
can we just say what we're both thinking? I'm looking at we're your eyes. We're gonna get to it. I want to oh. talk about. Oh, he wants the foreplay to stop. Oh. I'm so, so close. We got. We need I'm to so be close. able to have a game that can allow for heroic sacrifice. Agreed. But do so in a way that doesn't stop the flow of the game. We want it to be emotional. We want it to be intense. We want this both the story to feel it and the group to feel it. Yeah, most important to the group. We want a system that can do giant goddamn robots. Yes. Giant robots are hard to do. Now, you can't do D&D. You just can't. I have never played a D20 system, be it D20 Modern, D20 Future, D20 Classic, anything based on D&D. Agreed. I'm sorry. Agreed. I will I will agree with you as, as well. I've played as many of the runner-ups and the spin-offs and the retro clones and the OSR games. None of them do giant robots well. Agreed. But if you were doing a giant robot game defending a rift... We also want a game that's going to allow for play between both giant robot mode and human mode. You want to be able to have stories that take place on a personal face-to-face. We're not in our robots. We're in our underwear. We're in our skivvies. Yeah, we're agreed. In our, we're, we're back at headquarters, and we're having dinner. And so you'd say the, so the PCs would like two different classes? We want a game that can facilitate that kind of interaction. Uh-huh. Because Pacific Rim, as much as we love the giant robots punching monsters, it's also very heavily built upon relationships between the characters. Yes, yes And many is. of those relationships are not formed in the robot. They're formed outside. We want the former to inform the latter. I've got some ideas on okay. how to do this. And the first I'm going to talk you... about is a quick throwaway. I am currently in the middle of writing a game about mecha pilots fighting big giant monsters from space. It's more heavily inspired by Voltron or uh, Gunbuster or even the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers where you have like a color-coded team who combine their stuff together. But if you think about it, Pacific Rim is all about people combining their brains together to pilot a robot. So it fits that same theme. This game is called Gatai Bushido Fusion. It is based on my other game, Moto Bushido. By the time this airs, there will be a publicly accessible beta test. Ooh, please. Awesome. I'll, yeah, I'll have in. a link in the del- in the I'll have a link in the show notes. Please check it out. We're actually going to be playing it at WagonCon Sweet. coming up soon. So I hope you guys both get to experience it. I would love to. That's on- why you were looking for Voltron cards. Yes, because my game uses playing cards as the main mechanic instead of dice. It also uses Uno cards, but that's something else. <laughs> Is it the, it's the color code. It's on the Uno. color code. No, okay. And again, it's heavily based on the Super Sentai style of Japanese action television show stuff. Voltron, you each have a different color. You each have a different thing. Anyway, team-based, working together, combining together to control a giant robot, just like Pacific Rim. Okay. Next, I want to talk about a classic game, Battletech. Battletech. Ooh, God, I was so horny over mine. I didn't even consider <laughs> Battletech. That's where I, I thought you were going to go with Battletech. Battletech is a skirmish oh, game why didn't I think of that? with assemblable minis and giant battlefields. Oh, it's so It has fun. a rich culture of people getting in giant mecha suits to fight each other. There's not so much the giant ro- giant monsters. But you, you could add it, yeah. In robot suits. And there's an attached role-playing game called Mech Warrior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so easy to take Mech Warrior and tie it into the Battletech minis game and to go back and forth. I know other podcasts even talk about this very is heavily. That, is that technically wargaming, though? No. Uh, it's it's That counts as RPG? Yes. Okay. Battletech by itself, with just going by the unit rules, is kind of wargaming. It's like Warhammer. Yeah. Battletech and, is yeah, it's all miniature based. no longer as popular as it used to be, but the Mech Warrior role-playing game is still published and in fact there's in fact mech- there's a new one isn't there There is yeah mech warrior classic i think i, I, I think i have a couple it. friends yeah. down in phoenix that yeah. that still play so. battletech battletech classic and mech warrior classic that game has its own mythology and its own history but it has really solid rules for character development 
really solid rules for robot construction. Yeah. Okay. And really and gets good. into the details. Like if you want to blow coolant to freeze the monster, Battletech might be the one. And if you want rules for that, <laughs> Battletech will be down the one. to the temperature of the coolant, <laughs> then Battletech is probably what you want. And I do want to give an honorable mention to a game that we've talked about previously called The Robotic Age. Oh yeah. I remember that one. We mentioned this one on the Transformers episode. Yeah. This one I think could work just fine. It's got robot rules, robot combat rules, robot fighting. It's got everything you would want. Now that game is built upon the premise of you actually being a robot. Right. But it could function. Get the job. I, I'd say Battletech over there. However, that. I didn't even consider that. That's such a I love Battletech. Right. Now something to think about here is that we have a movie about robots. And those robots are fighting giant monsters from space. And those monsters come through a rift. rift. Yes. Do you have it on your shelf? Can I go grab it? And the game that I ultimately, personally, passionately would do. It better be the same. I'm going to freak the fuck out. The game that I want to talk about today. I'm so excited. (laughs) Are you now? Oh, my God. I've been waiting for this game. Rift. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, finally. (laughs) I can stop flirting with this shit. Yes, Rifts is the perfect fucking palladium game to play this in. (laughs) It is literally giant monsters, giant robots through Rift. You're not excited, not at all. No, I'm not vibrating with glee at all. If If you could see Matthew right now, he is kind of sort of vibrating. It is one of my favorite games of all time. Rifts, I I can't think of anything better that I would do for Rift than than Rifts. I I respect it, but I never got into Rifts that much. All right, so in Rifts, you have characters that have basic skills. You're a person. Yeah. You do a thing. You know, one of the character class, you you have a character class. You have stats. You have skills. You know, it's a classic old school RPG. Yeah, it's been around a long time. With a sci-fi post-apocalyptic bent to it, I, now, I've seen some of the cover work, and I love, I love the artwork. I specifically want to bring attention to Rifts: Chaos Earth, which is an offshoot of Rifts that doesn't take place in the Rifts era. It takes place in the pre-Rifts era, and it has giant robots. It has... I'm sorry. Nathaniel, is this on your shelf? Can I go grab it? I don't have it here, Ah, unfortunately. I'm in the middle of moving. Ah. Rift (laughs) is the classic Palladium game. It is the game that most people think of when they think Palladium. Yes. Now, Palladium, for all its faults, for all of its weird anachronisms and its antiquated game system, I fully attest, is a perfectly playable game. It is simple. It is far less complicated than its intimidating facade might make you believe. And to make things even better, there is a homebrew version of it called Microlite Platinum, which streamlines so much of the system and makes it so that you can sit down and make a Palladium character for any of their systems, including Rift, without all the bullshit. And you can just start playing. Yeah. Uh, you can take any Palladium character for anything, up to and including Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and drop it into Rifts. Interesting. It is a multiverse. It is a meeting ground of many It is not systems. a multiverse. It is a megaverse. megaverse. Yes. Okay. Trademarked by Palladium. <laughs> One thing that Rifts does is it has a character class called the like the robot jock or the robot pilot or something like I'm that. I'm playing a Glitter Boy, final answer. And a you Glitter get, Boy? Mm-hmm. Is that a real thing? Yep. The Glitter Boy is a suit of power armor. that With a big-ass gun and, like, the rocket-propelled things that shoot into the ground so you can fire this big-ass gun without Jeez. going ass over tea kettle over the mountain range. All okay. right, let's talk a little bit about what Rifts is. Rifts is a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. It is set on Earth, actually, by the default core book. It's set in North America. Mm-hmm. It is set in a post-apocalyptic setting. It is hundreds, if not thousands of years after some kind of an apocalypse happened. Okay. Ley lines erupted across the earth. Strange extra-dimensional terrors came through. Parts of the world were just 
just completely destroyed, reformed by magical and extra dimensional energies that changed the very surface of the planet. Atlantis rose from the ocean. A dimensional rift has opened at every intersection of ley lines. Strange creatures and monsters, dinosaurs, aliens, dragons, fantasy worlds, everything has now converged upon yeah. rifts. Elves, orcs, ogres, and, and dragons. There was oh, something the same time. that happened in the late 22nd, 23rd century or something. I forget what the timeline. They don't really tell you because the concept of Rift's Earth is that nobody actually knows what happened. Yeah, it's just magic turned back on. These ley lines erupted yeah. and opened gates. So is, is that the same sense as, say, Shadowrun? Because Shadowrun had that same... That same thing, like magic just returned. Add 500 years to Shadowrun. Okay, yeah. cool. All and right. Add 500 years and a world-changing, destroying apocalypse. Okay, so the reason why I never got into Rifts was because as a kid, everybody that I grew up with, they just they wanted to stick to Dungeons & Dragons. I had that one friend that wanted to do Palladium, but it was always so in-depth that, that by the time we got done with a character, the Friday night was done and we were in the Saturday morning. Rifts. We did is, GURPS, though. We did GURPS from time to time. Rifts is Dungeons & Dragons plus laser guns and power armor on Earth. Mecha. It's, yeah. it's, okay. it's a mecha game. So you can, you can play a D&D style campaign in Rifts. You have characters like the Cyber Knight. They mm -hmm. are paladins of order who have match who have like psionic blades that come out of their magical armor. You can play some dude who does nothing but ride a horse and shoot a bow. Yeah. You can play somebody who actually has no skills whatsoever and is tagging along with the group. They call them vagabonds. You can play a glitter boy. Glitter boys are gigantic reflective suits of power armor with a massive gun on the shoulder. That's the glitter because it dispenses lasers. Yeah. It, okay. You can it's play not it. actually glitter boy. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> rogue scholars, rogue scientists. Those are actually operators. really fun to play. And they, have the most they would be in this movie. This movie has all of the trappings of a basic rifts game minus the post-apocalypse. This is... While the apocalypse is happening. This, this is, is the opening of the rift. Yeah. The, the rift has opened and the apocalypse is happening. And we have giant robots, which rifts has rules for. Okay. We have robot jocks, which rifts has rules for. We have a pair of scientists, which rifts has, has rules, rules for. for. Okay. Go. I mean, yeah, it's, it's this game. I, I'm glad you gave um, Battletech a mention because good on you for that. But this is so rifts. I can't think of a game that I've ever played that does robot, giant robot combat better than yeah. the experiences that I've had in Rifts. And I say this as somebody who has played many indie games, many tabletop games, many skirmish games. Something about rolling a handful of dice for your missile volley, then rolling a handful of dice for your chest laser, then rolling a die for your wrist blade, then rolling a die for your jetpack power slam. Now, okay, so I have a question. Yeah. Because I haven't played Rifts, is that you can do that all in one turn. Like you announce, I'm going to use my my laser, my my shoulder cannon, my chest cannon, and I'm lobbing out missiles from someplace else on my mech. So you would roll one set of die, and then the GM would say, "Okay, roll for your your other set, and then roll for your other set." So here's where we get to the complication of rifts. Mm. With rifts, <laughs> you're did combat. I just do a party foul and oh, kill no, the party? No no, 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 it's it's fair because it's so beautiful. But rifts. As we've mentioned before, it's a Palladium game, and Palladium games are difficult to learn because they're not actually written to be learned. Palladium is a game that is the best played if you were taught it by somebody who learned it down the line eventually from Kevin Ciambietta himself. I, I will break in real fast and say that Rifts actually bills itself as an advanced role-playing game. It, it's right in the very beginning that if you are a first-time player, Go play something and then come back. And by advanced, that means we didn't feel like writing all these rules down. <laughs> Fuck it, <they're> really <laughs> so are there, with Rifts, are there a lot of just like homegrown rules, house rules? Oh, or yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. if I were to play with, say, Matthew on a, on a Rifts campaign and then, you know, jump for joy that I love that and then come and play with you, I might find that what I was doing in his campaign is completely different than what I can Absolutely. and can't do. Yeah. So, oh, that example, sucks. For example. Let's say you're playing a giant robot. You have a missile, and that missile does 
17 D4 damage. Mega range, damage. At a range of 1,000 feet. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> All right. 17 D4 damage at uh-huh. a range of 1,000 feet. 17 Mega D- damage. Damn. Right, hold on. 17 D4 damage, range of 1,000 feet. You get but, huge dice collections. But yeah. that's all that's written down. Okay. That's it. It doesn't say to doesn't strike. Say, it doesn't say yeah. what you're rolling against. It, yeah. Oh, wow. It's So it's they leave a lot to just it, interpretation. Yeah. And it's taking it against its mega damage, right? Okay. So <laughs> here's here's where shit gets complex. Like, let's say two PCs are arguing over some piece of loot, and they decide that it's going to come to blow. So the DM can't fudge this because we have two character sheets right in front of us. So I go, well, I fire off a volley of missiles at you. And you go, I dodge. And everyone stops, and they look at their books, and they say, well, I see a skill called dodge. How do I use it? Um, yeah. Uh, dodge, dodge. Increases dodge chance. All right. What, what am I rolling at? 5%? The problem oh, here is I see. that okay, the I rules see. do a shitty job of explaining themselves. Yeah. So if you have been taught how to play Rifts, you already know how to resolve this situation. If you are buying the books, you're in for a nightmare of page references because Kevin Ciambada is terrible when it comes to referencing his own rules. There's almost never an index. Wow. And frequently the rules that you need are actually in the third book and only mentioned as an afterthought. That's the problem with Palladium games. I would hurt someone for that. I would literally find someone to hurt. A lot of people have been hurt <laughs> over that. So, you, you homebrew. You're in luck. There's a version of Rifts done, licensed officially in Savage I am Savage honestly World. really excited about that. Savage Worlds is one of my favorite gaming systems. I've written for Savage Worlds. I've run Savage Worlds. It's the game that I know more than any other game. Savage Rifts, it's awesome. I would not run Savage Rifts for. I know this. you, you want right. the classic because you want all the expanded universe shit. I want okay, the thank you for expanded stuff. I want the extended rules. I want the individual <laughs> robot mega damage. Yes, capacity Dusty, total. There, are, there is. God, I want to say forty books and like easily eighty micro books okay. on Rifts called the Rifter. Yeah, uh, it was like a periodical that came no, out. It is. A periodical. It is still in publication. Um, So then there's more than 80. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's been going since, what, 89? I don't know. Okay. Rifts is the most supported game system in history. It had to be because no one knew how to fucking play it. (laughs) And it is still in publication. He is still popping out books. He has never released a second edition, and he never will. Why? Because that's how Kevin Ciambietta is. He has a game system that has worked for him and his groups and his fans since the late 80s, and he's going to keep publishing books for it. So if it's not not broke, don't fix it. Godspeed to him. Okay. Well, I can respect that. I will say that that Savage Rift is a game that I kickstarted. However, I would run Savage. I I would Run. run... Rift yeah. for this because when it comes to giant robots, Savage Rifts does not give anywhere near the level of satisfaction that Rifts Core does. Launching volleys of 30 <laughs> missiles, five turbo lasers, and a power punch at the same time. Okay, you so just I have a, don't have that satisfaction. I have a question, have a question on, on 30 missiles. Do you drop a dice bomb and that's like you, you hit with X and you get damage on those, or do you have to roll damage for each single missile? Oh fuck you! <laughs> fuck you! That look that I just gave Dusty. No, I never want to play this game now. Fuck it's that! So no. good though. It's, I don't care how pretty it looks. No, I'm. It's no. it's uh-uh, it's, it's, uh-uh. it's like that drink at the bar where you're going. He just picked up Sambuca Bailey's Curacao. What what is he doing with that tea bag? And He's shaking all this shit together, and you're like, this is going to taste like death. And you're like, oh, it's light and cinnamony. This is delicious. And it, <laughs> all the ingredients are wrong. It's just like that. Everything is wrong, but it's so good. That is the best description of riffs I've ever <laughs> that's, heard. That's kind life. of awesome. <laughs> it's, it, 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 when you're looking at it and you're looking at it being made, you're like, oh, this is going to be awful. But it's not, and it's brilliant and glorious. And you actually get to spend time on your turn, which is something I very much like in gaming. So I'm going to give you a breakdown of how the Rifts actions work in combat. Please do. Hey, listeners, 
listen up because you may never hear this again. <laughs> you have a combat round like you would expect in any standard role playing game. And on your round, you get an action. And then it goes around and around and around. You roll initiative, you act, okay. they act, your friend act, you act, they act, your friend acts, and so on. However, in Rifts and all the Palladium games, you have a number of actions per round. So on your turn, you get X number of actions. Now, everybody's got their own way of handling it, but it, from what I understand, the default way of handling it is as such. It's your turn. You have eight actions on your turn. Okay. Jesus. All right. First action. I'm going to fire a volley of missiles. They fire off. You roll a die to see how many of them hit. You roll a die to see how many of them hit, and then you roll whatever the damage, and then you just multiply it because we want to move this along. So okay. You, Bam, they hit. Now, your opponent, they also have eight actions. So now they're going to spend one of their actions to do a counterattack. So they fire another volley of missiles at you. I'm going to go ahead and make the sucking in sound into a whoosh. Because <laughs> that, that sounded more like tentacles and grabbing onto something. Missiles. You roll, and then they roll. And uh-huh. then you roll, and then they roll. Now, they might also get a defensive roll, but when it comes to missiles, you can't fucking dodge missiles. It, it kind of yeah. sounds like we're going to play this game called Let's See Who Can Hit the Hardest. That's what fucking robot combat <laughs> yeah, is. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Seriously, you watched Pacific Rim. But it, here's the thing. It's completely different the moment you step out of power armor. It's a whole different uh, yeah. system. Okay. The moment you step out of your armor, it's please don't hit me, please don't hit me, please don't hit me. Because everything around you, it's, I've explained this before on the podcast, so I'll just brush it fast, but it's structural damage capacity, hit points, and mega damage capacity. A structural damage is 1,000 of those to one mega damage point. Okay. Yeah. 100. 1,000. 100. Am I wrong? Yeah. Okay. 100. Still, it's a bunch. Listeners, correct us, please. Yes. Eh. So, it's it requires a stomach yeah for palladium a little bit of and fortitude it, 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 it also it also requires a lot of thought like when somebody else is doing something you are thinking you're planning your actions you're it, not just it's, it's not just okay because i know in D when people are, when you're going around a table you've got a party of eight yeah. you're not sitting you can, there eating your cheetos yeah, and checking you your, check your phone, phone. you're yeah. planning your shit okay. you're you're like i don't really know what's about to happen so i'm paying attention to what's going on because whatever this guy does might just fuck me that's a really interesting point i think one of the things i love most about palladium specifically and robotech and riffs in general is the amount of punishment a player character gets for tuning out, which which makes your group avid, and they're hanging on every word, and they're thinking all the time. It also involves the player in the defense. Mm-hmm. When you're attacked, you don't just take the damage. Okay. Okay. It's like you spend now your action running, attacked. dodging. <laughs> now you can try to dodge or parry or roll with the blow. You're given options that engage you as an active player, even when it's not your turn. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, you don't just sit there and absorb when you're not, when it's not your round. So, and one thing that people think about who come from D&D is, you know, with D&D, you get an action and that's it. I attack, I miss, it's your turn. With Palladium, you get multiple actions on your turn. So it's your turn. How are you going to spend your five actions? Okay. Okay, what your opponent gets that too. So they... It, 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 it's a... I'll be the monster. It's, it's I breathe fire. It's a breakdown in translation because people come from D&D expecting combat rounds that last six seconds. In Palladium, combat rounds last one minute. Yeah. And in oh, that minute, okay. a lot of things are happening. So people are like, oh, combat just doesn't move fast. No, it actually does it's just not moving at a six seconds per turn thing. On your turn, you're actually getting far more ability than you would think in a D&D round. And you don't just tune out at the end of you your turn. tune out. That's good. Because shit's still happening and you can still affect the ongoing story. We are probably the only podcasters who are consistently proselytizing at the teats Kevin Palladium. <laughs> Kevin Sambietta, <laughs> send us stuff! <laughs> Palladium Rifts is the game that I would run if I was going to do Pacific Rim. All you got to oh, do yeah. is trim down the character classes to Robot Jock, mm-hmm. and that's it. Robot and Jock, robot scientist, okay. scientist and, and boom. Oh, we've got these five robots. Okay, we're going to fight some giant monsters. Yeah. You don't have to run the whole post-apocalyptic thing. You can run it in the Rifts 
chaos earth setting there's cool. enough there go for it it's guys i want to talk about kevin long for a second <laughs> yes. the guy who does all the illustrations for early uh he doesn't do it anymore not all of them cmb had a did yeah, yeah. some art too but uh and his is actually really good for a writer oh, i mean yeah like amazing but kevin long does these amazing black and white and occasionally like poster quality uh prints and they're just scattered throughout all the early um palladium books and like i said you can still pick them up for pretty damn dirt cheap if you ever get the chance to pick up a pla- an early palladium book just just flip it up flip yeah. it open look through the art and you will understand why 12 year old matthew went <gasps> Wow. I, I will say I, I remember looking at a lot of the art when I was younger, and I always did like the artwork. Yeah, Plain and then you'll find yourself really spending the ten dollars to buy the book because I mean, fuck it, what's ten dollars? Then you'll be reading the book, and then you'll be right where I am with a mountain of Palladium books and no one to play them with. So seriously, buy them so we can play together. Rifts, it's what I would do, and specifically old school rifts, original rifts, not the savage rifts for this. I haven't compared and contrasted. I just know that. The, <clears throat> Excuse me. I just know that it exists. For a robot versus a monster, I think Rifts pulls it off way better than Savage Worlds does. It just, it has, you feel that tangible connection to the game that you just don't get. Savage Worlds doesn't have that visceral feeling. It's more pulpy. And yeah. this is definitely more of a visceral, punching a goddamn monster in the face game. I like that. Yeah. So riffs, I'm 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 fucking thrilled. I, I, it, I've been waiting for this. So. I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When we did that one, that was a great episode, and I loved it. And we got to do a Palladium game, and I was excited. But that was not that has never been the Palladium game to yeah, me. Sure. And they don't have a Robotech movie, so I'll never get a chance to do that. So it's riffs is always always love so much love. Any last words, folks? Bye, I, riffs. <laughs> I would like to learn riffs. I can loan you a book. We can make this happen, Dusty. We can make this happen. I'm down for it, and I'll just put it's it in the list of everything pass else on I'm doing. The knowledge <laughs> that we have attained, passed down from Siembira himself. You know, I, I would... Kevin's lore be praised. <laughs> I, would, I would really like to play in a riffs game with you. I know you'll probably never run one because you're outrunning more of the the fringe games and the the cutting edge of games i could run some goddamn riffs my friend fuck let's I'd, do it I'd, man i would love to get in on that but i run core rules only that's fine so I have, you I have just a, have to I have teach me as we go every step of the way so can, can i can i bring my robotech book no oh, sorry i don't want to play anymore core rules I kind of only. figured that was covered with that yeah <laughs> It is core rules. I mean, it's mentioned no, in the book. No, Robotech, no, no, Robotech, no, no, Robotech. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. We would need the conversion book for that and core rules. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Glitter boy it is. Rogue scientist. I like that. Cool. You can stand behind my glitter boy. <laughs> That's what they do. The yeah. glitter boy is there. Make to, sure, just make sure you're still tank. running. Okay. I typically always play like the the support character style. It's an extremely unbalanced game. But it's the kind of game that was built in this mentality that the balance is what the GM brings to the game. You you can have a vagabond and a rogue scholar and a glitter boy and a combat cyborg in the same party. The idea being, you don't expect the rogue scholar, the vagabond, to contribute to combat the same way. You expect them to carry the torch off screen or not, not even off screen. Just on a different screen. Yeah. Eventually. Outside of combat, you stay in that armored personnel carrier and don't you poke yeah, your nose out. That glitter boy is going to have to power down. They yeah. just can't stay in it. They got to get out to pee. They got to get out to Which eat. brings us back to the diapers. And they are also a person. The Those glitter nice boy is back. not just the armor. And if, it, if you're playing Palladium, if you're playing Rifts and your character is nothing but the sum of their armor, <laughs> then you're not doing it right. Yeah. That character has a personality. That character is Mako Mori or Jax Teller. They have a name. They have intentions. They have goals that have nothing to do with their armor. They are people, and you should play them. As An interesting note is that uh, the world has been broken, and America specifically, which is mostly in the core rule book, 
uh, has been broken into uh, city-state protectorates, okay. like Northern Gun. Uh, there's one for Texas. There's there's the future Nazis called the Coalition. Oh, yeah. those bastards. But they do have the coolest armor. They have the coolest armor. <laughs> they, they sure know how to dress. They The bad <laughs> oh, guys always God. look the coolest. We learned oh, I'm sorry. Did Nazis. Hugo Boss stop making clothes? <laughs> we learned this from the Nazis. Uh, we learned this from Cobra. Yeah. <laughs> and the Coalition is no exception. Is there a G.I. Joe role-playing game? I'm sure there probably. is. Probably, if if there isn't, there should be. If not, you could probably use any number of systems. I imagine Savage Worlds will acquire the license at some point in the near future because they are overwhelmed with licenses as it is. Yeah. On that note, we should close this out. Bye, riffs. Hi, everybody. I was Matthew, and I'm Dusty, and I'm Nathaniel, and still bye, riffs. Bye, rift. This was Pacific Rim. <laughs> yeah, Pacific Rim, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the game. What was it again? Rift. Riffs. Say it, Dusty. Say it. Riffs. Say it. Riffs. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the seed, and we'd love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Have Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production, and our episodes are distributed under CC BYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.